Roscoe and Sue, I just want to tell you it is a testament to the love that people have for your son that some almost four months later, after he has left us, we have a crowd on a Saturday in the fall this size. And that, that says a lot about your family, the love that the community has for you and for your son. And uh, we are all here today to celebrate. You know, too often we have a time when a person passes away and we get together and it's, it's for tears. And maybe the good thing is that we waited almost four months before we got together and, and celebrated not the death of Brian, but celebrated his life. You know, we all know what happens when we're born. And, and Brian was born on April the 15th, 1982. And he passed on June the 2nd, 2020. What's not important is the day that he passed or how he passed. You know, too often we find people say, well, how did it happen? What happened? It doesn't matter. What matters is he's gone. And what truly matters on top of that is how he lived his life between the day he was born and the day that he left. And today, that's what we are going to celebrate. The family asked it to be a celebration of life, and today we're going to have a celebration of life. Um, so after this service is over, when you've gotten your food and you're sitting down, we're going to do an open mic time. So you can come up here and be Gallagher and be as funny as you want and tell your stories about Brian because that's what we want to do. But today, just for a little bit, we're going to celebrate his life, and there's going to be tears, there's going to be music, there's going to be laughter, but that's what this is all about. That's what life is all about. You know, Brian came into the world a bundle of energy, and there's not a one of you here that, that knew Brian that didn't witness his humor and his energy and his daredevil lifestyle, and I'm sure you have stories about it. Um, there was motorcycle racing, rock climbing, tree cutting, and his big love of flying. When you look at the pictures around here today or you watch the videos that will be shown on the TVs, you're going to see a man that lived his life to the fullest. When he left, the day he left, no one could say, man, Brian didn't live. Because Brian lived to the fullest. You know, some people would would see a bridge and they might see someone bungee jumping and want to go out there and bungee jump. But I've seen pictures where Brian saw a bridge and took out all of his ropes and tied them to the bridge and swung out over the water and back up to the bridge. The water some 150 feet below. That was living at its best. I've seen pictures and videos of Brian cutting down trees and not just cutting a tree but aiming for a target and landing it right on the nickel because he did everything to the fullest and to the most perfection that he could do. You could kind of say he was OCD. <laughs> then there was motorcycle riding. He didn't just ride a motorcycle. He rode it fast. And he raced. I'm surprised, and, and I don't know, maybe he did. I'm surprised he didn't try to build a jump and jump over the house. Because that was Brian's personality, to live life to the fullest. And that's the Brian we're going to miss. Christmas was always a fun time for Brian, especially in the last few years. He would put a lot of work into finding the perfect gift that would make the person laugh. And then there was the other most second gift, which was sentimental. He loved to make people laugh. He couldn't just take a, a, a time and drive down the road and go to where he needed to go. I've watched videos where he's driving down the road and he's hanging out the window yelling to the person going by, slow down, slow down, like there's something coming up around the corner. And there's not. He's just jacking them. Just to get a rise out of somebody and get a laugh out of life. If he couldn't make you laugh, at least he wanted to make you smile. And he had a beautiful smile. We'll never forget that beautiful smile. But just as, just as energetic as he was at entertaining us, he was also very humble in his life. He did things to the fullest extent, extent, but he was humble in what he did. And then there was that time, let me go back a little bit. When, when Brian's older sister left for college, Brian was very young, but he worked very hard to keep that relationship growing up with his sister. His relationship with Krista was one of 
intelligence. His relationship with Aaron was one of giggling. I'm not saying Aaron's not intelligent. But Aaron and Roscoe had fun, Brian had fun. And then there was the relationship with mom, of being a mama's boy. And everything that mom helped him get through in life, he one day would come back and repay that by helping her get through the hard times herself. And then he was a lot like his dad in that he had a strong and powerful work ethic. So there's a lot we could say about Brian. On 10-3-2012, Brian left for Hawaii, and it would forever change his life. He went to helicopter school. There was training flights over beautiful islands, night flights, and there was that flight he took that time in Malibu for someone's special birthday where he said, it's always prettier to fly at night and see the lights than during the day. I believe that was your 40th, right? Yeah. All this to share a full life with those that he loved. But then we have the question, even though we want to celebrate today, we have the question of why. Why would something like this happen? And I, I want to share my thoughts in, in a, an old story that was shared with me when my grandfather passed away when I was just a little boy. Once upon a time, in a little pond in the muddy water under the lily pads, there was a community of water beetles. They lived a simple and happy life. Once in a while, sadness would come to the community when one of the little water beetles would climb up the stem of the lily pad and disappear, forever gone, never to be seen again. One day, one little water beetle felt an irresistible urge to swim the stem. However, he was determined he would not leave forever. And his friend said to him, come back and tell us what it's like up the water stem. He, would ever, he made the decision that he would ever come back and tell his friends what he had found at the top. But when he reached the top and climbed out of the water onto the surface of the lily pad, he was so tired and the sun felt so good and so warm. He decided to take a nap. As he slept, his body changed, and when he woke up, he had turned into a beautiful blue-tailed dragonfly with broad wings and a slender body designed for flying. How appropriate is that? So fly he did, and as he soared, he saw the beauty of the whole new world and far superior way of life than what he had known in the murky waters of the lily pond. Then he remembered his beetle friends and how they must be thinking that now he was gone, he was dead. He wanted to go back and tell them and explain to them that now he was more alive than he had ever been before, but his new body could not go down in the water. He could not get back and tell his friends the good news. It was then he understood that their time would come too, and they would see and feel what he did. In his realization, he raised his wings and flew into a joyous new life. And that's what Brian has done. He can't come back and tell us how great it is. I mean, when Jesus left, Jesus said, I go before you and make a home of many man a mansion of many rooms. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now that that project has been put in full speed, that Brian is probably loading stuff up with a helicopter and flying it and rushing Jesus and saying, we got to change this plan and design because Brian is going to do heaven his way. And he's going to build a mansion and rest Jesus so that when we get there, we have what Brian thinks is, is perfect, not just what Jesus thinks is perfect, because Brian loved you all so much. Can you imagine God's frustration right now, trying to keep that kid in control? It's probably not too easy. Today we have a few people who would like to say some words during the service, and I understand Jim Webster's not here could not make it. So Aaron, are you going to speak for him? Okay, so Aaron's going to come up and speak on behalf of Jim Webster. So I'm just going to read it uh, verbatim as if Jim were speaking. My name is Jim Webster, and I'm an old, pretty much retired defense attorney, but believe it or not, that's not how I met Brian. I've always called him Brian by the, um, I've always called him Brian since he was in high school and became a close friend and with my daughter, Marisa. They remained very close up until the time of his very untimely and tragic death. But 
which came while doing something that he loved and which I'm proud to say I had some part in helping him reach that goal. I may have done the legal work, but Brian did the real hard work. My work with Brian uh, lasted from late 2006 until about March of 2017. Um, he now has all of his cases dismissed and or expunged. At any rate, in November of 2010, we filed a motion for early termination of some um, certain instances with the Tuolumne County Court of Judge Eric L. Du Temple. <clears throat> um, it was strongly opposed at that time by the then DA Donald Sagerstrom, who is now a judge, and who was re represented in court by then Assistant DA Mike Knowles. M Mr. Knowles has a son who's an air airline pilot, and during our closing arguments, he told the judge quite empathetic empathetically, he knew the FAA, and he knew that Brian would never become a commercial pi licensed pilot. We were blessed to be in front of a judge who was not only very conservative, but also open to reason and common sense and had some decent amount of empathy for defendants and very much believed in the power of recovery and redemption. I basically said BS to Mr. Knowles because I have been talking to people with a FAA and the judge agreed, granted our motion and the rest is history. I'm so sorry I was unable to be there personally, but I'm in the very high risk category for COVID and my wife and daughter were about to kill me if I was to arrive. Sue, Ross, Aaron, and Krista, you had a wonderful son and brother who is now in a definitely better place and we will all miss him and his smiling face very much. Love, Jim, Celia, and Marisa Webster. Overcoming obstacles is what Brian was all about. Cody Fisher. All right, I'm going to try and keep this together for you all. For those who don't know me, I'm Cody Francis. I know this is our day to celebrate Roscoe's life here on Earth, but I'd like to begin with thanking both Ross and Sue, because without them, he and I would not have been as close as we were. 2006, Roscoe and I had been hanging out for probably about three months, pretty solid. I got kicked out of the house that I was living in, and we sat there in his truck for a minute, and uh, he goes, just load your shit up in the back of my truck, take it to your parents' house, you're gonna come stay with me. My dad hadn't talked to his parents or anything at this point. So that's what we did, we loaded up my stuff, took it to my parents. And uh, he comes to the house, he goes, is it okay if Cody stays for a while? That was pretty much it. And out of the unconditional love for their son, they took a guy in that they didn't really know very well, gave him a job, gave me a place to stay, and treated me like family. She definitely did not make our lunch every day. <laughs> oh, God. My life could have gone a lot of different directions at that point. And I would not be who I am today without you. And I love you both. Most of all, it gave me the opportunity to develop uh, the greatest friendship with one of the most amazing guys I've ever had the privilege of knowing. Can't begin to put into words the amount of happy, happiness and laughter that he brought to my life. We had a unique way of immortalizing the most potentially insignificant moments, whether it was through a single word, a phrase, an acronym, a song lyric, one of our retarded songs that we made up. And over all the years, we developed a way of communicating with each other that would not only be relevant to that moment, but would take you back to the origin immediately. I hope that I had half the impact on his life as he had on mine. It's no secret we weren't always the best influence on each other, but damn, we had fun. <laughs> I'm going to miss our constant competition and banter when it came to anything. I've always said that nothing made him happier than beating me or outsmarting me at literally anything at all. 
Oh. I suppose I could say the same thing about myself, though. <laughs> he had a constant drive to be better and cleaner than everyone at whatever he was doing, and most of the time he was. I'd like to share one of my favorite stories of ours that I feel encompasses how he lived his everyday life. It's like a... Two o'clock in the afternoon, we got off work a little early, and he says, uh, let's go run around Pinecrest, jump off rocks. I'm like, all right, cool. Call Garrett, let him know. So we call Garrett. Garrett, he's like, what's up? We're coming to get you. We're going to Pinecrest. We're going to run around the lake. We're going to jump off rocks. He's like, all right, cool. All right, see you in 11 minutes. So <laughs> we pick him up, get up to Pinecrest, get all the way around, pass the dam, and if any of you are familiar, there's that like sheer face that kind of kicks out where you have to boost out away from the rocks to clear them. So we found a good jump spot, had like a, like a two-step launch. Garrett goes, I go, just get out of the water, and Roscoe lands, and he comes up, and he's white as a ghost. And he goes, I hit. I'm like, bottom? And he's like, no, I clipped my shoulder. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm already looking for blood somewhere. I'm, I'm thinking he's wide open. You hit something at that fast. I was like, you need to turn around so I could see it. And he kind of pops up out of the water, and he's got this little, like, one inch by half inch, like, scrape. Took, like, three layers of skin off. So I slapped him in the shoulder, and I was like, let's roll. So we get all the way around to where the cabins are, and we decide to sprint all the way back to the truck. Mind you, we didn't bring any water or anything. It's four and a half miles around Pinecrest, in case nobody knew. So living off lake water, I suppose. So we decide to sprint all the way back from the cabins back to the parking lot to the truck. And, of course, Mr. Cross Country over there was leading the pack, and it left Roscoe and I behind him killing each other, like trying to keep up. But we did. Nevertheless, just to throw that out there, we did keep up. We get back to the truck and pound of water. Been sitting there for maybe like one or two minutes, barely caught our breath, and he just takes off running. Gets it. I want to say it was like a 100-foot pine tree. It probably wasn't. It was probably like 70. Climbed it with no gear or anything. And he just sprang to the top of this thing, gets up to the top, and he's swinging like this. <laughs> As far as he could huck the top of that frigging tree, throwing it around, just laughing. <laughs> and that was a Wednesday. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so if that doesn't say everything, I don't know what does. But uh, nothing was too big for that guy. Maybe he was just too big for this world. I'll, I'll close in saying he was the best friend that I could have ever asked for. And I will continue to live my life with him in my ear and in my heart for as long as I'm here. I miss you every day, brother. Until we meet again, I love you more than you know. You better be the first one to greet me when I get there. You know, I would be amiss not to talk about the fact that Brian was also a second dad to Sir Lancelot and Taylor. And he would take them to Little League and bike racing and any other events that they needed to do or if they just needed someone to talk to, shoulder to lean on, shoulder to cry on. And I know that your hearts are breaking today too. And I just wanted to make sure that this group of people today hugged on, loved on you too, because you're, you're hurting as well. But a special bond is one that is first created in the womb. He tore the hell out of you, I'm sure. But he came out and he was yours first. Sisters might say he was theirs, but he was yours first. So Sue, can you come up and tell us a little bit about your baby boy? Well, wow. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Those of you who don't know who I am, I'm mom, <laughs> Roscoe's mom. And you'll hear, as uh, was shared earlier, he was known in his younger years as Brian and Roscoe to many of you as he grew up. 
I was older. So I interchange them both. <laughs> Our hearts are overflowing with all the love and support that we've received from all of you. And from his coworkers, at PJ Helicopters, and the pg and &E family, and all the linemen at IBEW 1245. The support has been amazing, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome Travis Scholl family that's with us today. We've been blessed with your love and support. Brian was the best son, brother, uncle, friend, co-worker. He has two older sisters, Krista and Erin, who he doted on him the day he was born. I used to tease him and say, you know, you had to put him down because he's never going to learn to walk. <laughs> <laughs> A memory I love is when uh, he wasn't old enough to go to school yet, and uh, the school bus stopped right in front of our house. It was so convenient. And we had this nice big picture window. So Brian would hear that bus coming, and he'd just hightail it to that window, wearing his underoos, his cowboy boots, and sucking his thumb. <laughs> Nothing else. They'd come in the door and say, Mom, you can't let him stand there looking dressed like that. That's so embarrassing. Oh, he adored his big sisters. He was always full of energy, a little spitfire who always kept us on our toes, and he never did slow down. He was the best uncle to his niece Taylor and nephews Lance and Ronan. When uncle would walk in the door, Taylor would just go flying into his arms. And wrap her legs around him and he never he was ready for it and she did that well into her teen years <laughs> she finally had to give that up and he had nicknames for both of them taylor was numero uno and lance was naughty <laughs> <laughs> and of course he took his love of riding motorcycles and instilled it in lance he loved motocross racing he took Lance to his first race when he was five. He trained him well, full throttle. Lance took off from the start line, hanging on to the handlebars, not letting off the gas. He did a little stu Superman stunt. He didn't let off the throttle, handlebars. He was riding Roscoe style. It was a great day. Lance walked away feeling like he was a big deal, and he got a trophy. Brian didn't get to spend as much time as with his uh, nephew Ronan as he would have liked to because of distance, but he loved seeing him whenever he could. Roscoe was the fun uncle to many of his friends' children, and he loved celebrating their birthdays with them or whatever get-together. He was a really good uncle to a lot of young people in this crowd. Brian worked with his dad doing tree work from a very young age. One of the stories that I remember when uh, Brian was about five, Ross would touch base with the homeowner if he knew them and say, is it okay if I bring my son? He likes to come and help me. And he'd uh, cut a uh, side a brush for him and give him pruning shears and Brian had just cut away on that pile of brush, just cut it down. And uh, one time he, Ross went out front with the homeowner and he was showing him something out front and he came back and Brian was super excited, he goes, look what I did! I trimmed the bushes. Well, he trimmed some juniper bushes that weren't part of the, the job. And Ross has this like, oh no. And he says, the homeowner's wife. She goes, it's okay, I've been watching him. He is a hard worker like you are. <laughs> In fact, he used to take, when he'd take him on these little jobs, he'd pick up dirt from the bottom and rub it on his pants because he wanted to look like his dad. <laughs> so, uh, 
they would, uh, Roscoe was known for his humor, and he got that from his dad. They would joke throughout their work day, as many of you that worked with them could attest to. They knew how to have a good time, even when they were working. He was full of life, laughter, zest for life, funny, just simply like no other. He wanted to try so many new things and was never afraid. He had no fear. Roscoe enjoyed life and was eager to taste all that it offered. When Roscoe decided he wanted to try something new, he was determined to make it happen. He wasn't satisfied with just accomplishing something new, but he had to give it 110 plus. He had to give it his best, whether it was tree work, dirt bike riding, motocross riding, street bike riding, rock climbing. Where else do you go from there? The sky. Roscoe was injured while on a tree job and needed to be metaflighted. That's when his dream of helicopters, flying helicopters, was born. And he persevered to make that dream a reality. As we heard, he jumped through quite a few hoops. Family was very important to Roscoe. His grandpa Jack, my dad, was a pilot in the Navy. And at my dad's memorial, a former military officer who knew my dad told my sister Terry that our dad was always calm under pressure. So when she found out that Brian wanted to become a helicopter pilot, she had a dog tag engraved. And one side said Grandpa Jack, and the other said calm under pressure. Brian treasured the keepsake and kept it with him whenever he'd fly, strapped on his flight bag. He loved flying helicopters. He had a bucket list of various types of work that he wanted to do. Check off that list. And he loved the challenges of flying loads. He was a numbers guy, precise, meticulous, extremely detailed. With his tree background work, one of those things he wanted to check off his list was flying Christmas trees. So he got to do that up in Oregon. And then he did some firefighting work, but the power line sector was his ultimate, ultimate goal. He would tell me all the time. He was living his dream. It's what every parent hopes for their children, is to love what they're doing and to be able to do it every day of their life. Roscoe touched many lives. We will all miss his infectious laugh and that smile that just enveloped you. Anyone that hung around Roscoe for any length of time knew what a junk food junkie he was. He loved his Taco Bell, <laughs> round table pizza, and stash of snacks. So, I don't know if you had a chance to see his diabetes table over there, but please help yourself to some of, those are his favorite snacks over there. Jimmy, Travis, and Roscoe loved to work together. They were a great team. They were all living their dream. We've gotten to little, know a little bit about our boys and from their families and now understand why they worked so well together. They were so much alike, all living their dream, knowing the risks that they were taking, loving what they were doing every day. Many of the linemen have shared how much they love to work with Roscoe. They shared how he made their jobs easier because of the extra work he would spend setting up everything to make their job go smoothly for all of them. Again, he was pretty precise, meticulous while doing his work. His friends have shared some amazing, wonderful memories that have meant so much to our family. And 
uh, it helps us get through these tough times, memories we never knew anything about. So please know that you've provided such comfort and love to the family. And so, as Ron had mentioned, we are going to pass the mic. And those that aren't, you know, up to coming up to the mic and sharing some memories that you'd like to share, we have memory cards back here that you can fill out and leave it in the gas can. And the family can enjoy those later. We'd love that. Uh, I will miss your hugs, your calls, your visits. We'll miss you walking into the house and everyone yelling out, Uncle! <laughs> your special greeting that you shared with Aaron when he was able to make it down for a visit, he would make his rounds to all his family and friends, as many as he could. And he made everyone feel special, like he just came down to see them. His last visit home was on Memorial Day weekend. And we had a great visit, sharing, catching up. And then I, I stopped and said, you know, enough about all this. Tell me what's going on at work. Oh my gosh, his face lit up. And he started sharing everything that was involved in this power line work. If you talked to him at all about his flying, you knew how excited he'd get, as he was living his dream. Wherever Roscoe worked as a helicopter pilot, the common thread that's been shared with us is how much they loved seeing him walk in the door, whether it was at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, he would have that Roscoe smile and the excitement every time. He would share the new things he learned that day or experienced that day, all with his contagious enthusiasm. Brian, I'm so proud of the man you became. You grew into a kind, generous, solid man. You captured the essence of life with so many accomplishments in your 38 years, all while staying humble. Thank you for the life you brought to our family, how you lived it and gave it in the great way that you always do. You worked hard to become a helicopter pilot and did whatever it took to make that dream happen. You worked hard to get to where you were. I love that he loved his life. We will miss you, Roscoe. We'll forever hold you in our hearts. Remember your zest for life. Laughed often and find someone ready to have fun. One of his friends said it well on one of his posts. We need more Roscoe in the world. Roscoe, I'm going to love you forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. You know, I, I have been friends with Erin for quite, quite some time. And it's a love of friendship that I have for her and, and Joel that is unmatched for any other friendship and I love that I have for anyone else. So it's only because of that love for her that I agreed that I would do something as crazy as this today. I'm 55 years old. I'm not a daredevil. I have Parkinson's. I shake a lot. And I stutter. But what Ryan loved to do the most was get up on a chair and do it with me. Born in the USA, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA. Now, wait a minute. If I can stand up here and shake with Parkinson's and make myself look like a fool, as no other minister would do, you can sing it with me. So let's do four lines of it. Ready? Born in the USA, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA. How dare you?
they do. <laughs> he was in his underwear. I really love you. My wife is standing over there screaming, no, don't. Uh, I talked to Roscoe this morning in my head, and I'm going to prove it to everybody here in just a second. But before I do that, he wanted me to have us bow our heads and pray for the two other souls that were uh, taken from this plan, from this, from this, this place that we call Earth, whatever you want to call it, this incantation of... Uh, of bodies. So I'll ask you to, to bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come together in, in honor of Roscoe Gray today. And <sighs> he wants everyone to know that we all got to do better. He's, he wants to say that uh, to the friends, family, and loved ones, of the fallen, he loves you too. Amen. Now, the, what I've been seeing all today, all the, oh, it's been killing me over here to watch, to watch Sue come up and talk. And Sue, I don't even know if you know who I am. And that's okay. That's okay. My name's Matt. That's all you need to know. It's not about me. Like I said, Roscoe asked me to come talk, come talk today, and I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute, and you're the one that's going to be the most weirded out by all this. Um, and I, 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 oh no, it's going to weird you out, trust me. Um, and it, Roscoe would not have it any other way. He would not have it any other way. He's one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. He could hang out with a fool and have a great time, and he could talk to a genius and put you right on his level. And for those of you that know him real well, you know that. The guy had no fear, no fear, not a fear, fearful bone in his body. When I was nine years old, my mother was killed, and uh, when we went to this, this kind of a deal, I didn't mourn, I didn't cry. I decided I was going to process her death, her physical death, the way I wanted to, and I did that, and I told everybody, I said, she's not gone, she's just not here anymore. She's just gone, she's just not here anymore, and I have lived that my entire life, and I still believe it. I got up this morning, and my sisters, they think I'm kind of weird. I, I, you know, I just kind of interrupted this whole thing real quick up here. And my sisters think that our mom comes to me and us with dragonflies. And you can see them. They're all around here today. And by the way, his story was about dragonflies. Also, the last two months, we had smoke in the sky all damn day. And yesterday, the rains came. And so now we got clear skies. I can't believe it. Something's going on, guys. We got to do better. Your story, Ron, was about what? The one you, the, you were talking about the beetles and the pond and the, the limb. The dragonflies. And your reference to dragonflies was about, I, I assume it was Roscoe, correct? Roscoe's the dragonfly, right? My mom, my sisters have told me forever it's dragonflies. Well, this morning, about an hour before I left here today, I went outside and on the ground, was a dead dragonfly. And I brought it here today to give to his parents. I've never met you before. I've never, I've not, I don't know all the people here. I, I'm, I'm part of the, the, the 10, 15 years ago, and Roscoe was crazy. I'm the guy that judges. I'm, me, my friends and I and Roscoe, we are the crew of love that is at this party. That Roscoe was the littlest one, and he was the least afraid of all of us, which is why he wanted to be around us. I'm the one, we are the ones, Roscoe are the ones the judges were afraid of, and they were every bit of right to be afraid of us. But you know what? He became a helicopter pilot, and he did every single thing that he ever set out to do. Here's the uh, body of a dead dragonfly. Love you guys. That's your son saying hello to you. So we're going to move on now, and I'm going to ask for 
I'm going to keep my pants on. I'm going to ask for Erin to come up. And she's going to say a few words. Doesn't she look stunning today? I'm sticking with the program, Matt. I was expected to speak before everybody else. Anyways, I'm Erin Lafayette. I am Roscoe's sister. We'll talk about the order of that. Brian, worker, beads, sco, heat, uncle. Roscoe Brian Gray. As uh, my mom had talked about earlier, he was named after our dad, Roscoe. So to alleviate any confusion while, when he was growing up, we referred to him as Brian. But somewhere in the midst of his 20s, he wanted to be known as Roscoe. So out of respect for my little brother, I will refer to him as Roscoe while I'm up here. On April 15th, 1982, I was seven and our older sister was 12. On April 15th, 1982, Roscoe made me the middle child. <laughs> he was the baby of the family, obviously adored by all of his family. I can recall spending so many days playing with him in the backyard, pushing him on the rope swing, or me being on the rope swing and accidentally knocking into him, slamming his head back, splitting it open. Uh, maybe I had him in the red radio flow flyer wagon, pushing him down the neighbor's driveway into some blackberry bushes. When he was little, he hated butter. And one time we were at the Golden Corral and my meal came with a little paper cup that resembled a scoop of vanilla ice cream. So I did what any big sister would do and offered my ice cream to Roscoe. He was so excited, that huge grin on his face. He takes his spoon, digs into the cup, shoves it in his mouth as I'm like anxiously waiting for his reaction, right? I got it. You idiot! All eyes were on us, and needless to say, I got in trouble. Uh, even throughout the, his, our adult years, um, if we were in the car together, passing a Golden Corral restaurant, I would just feel the glare as he's looking at me like, ugh. Or I would get random text message pictures of a Golden Corral restaurant that he was driving by. <laughs> All the while, I'm just tickled pink that I pulled that stunt so many years ago. And I'm still proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> As the years went by and we became adults, we still love being around each other. I called him often after he became a pilot, mostly crying out of happiness of how proud I am of him for all of the work that he put through to do his dream job. I always told him how much I love him. I never wanted him to not know where I stand. I'd never witnessed one person persevere so much doubt, time, or money into a passion as Roscoe did to become a longline helicopter pilot. He did it, and he did it oh so well. We've shared countless laughs, a few memories that I can't repeat, but mostly what I have embedded in my mind and my heart is that feeling I would get when he would come to see me. My world completely went away when I saw that huge smile walk through my front door. I still well with emotion and I feel it. The world went away, excuse me, I already said that. <laughs> um, he wasn't just an uncle to my children and to my nephew Ronan. He was their friend, mentor, and at times a figure father that they looked up to. He wasn't just a brother-in-law to my husband. He was a friend and at times a co-worker, most recently as last year when um, Brian had one of his, excuse me, Roscoe, had one of his favorite jobs up at Relief. 
He's flying up in the sky while my husband's down below. To the families of Jimmy Wasden and Travis Scholl, unfortunately, um, Jimmy's wife is unable to be here today. Um, Travis and Jimmy were linemen who had the pleasure of working with Roscoe for several months. And they were one of the, what I understand, several crews who would buy for Roscoe to be their pilot, and Jimmy and Travis won. I remember Roscoe calling me um, that weekend before, and he was so excited because he got to um, work with the dream team, as they um, like to refer to themselves, or at least that's what Roscoe told me. <laughs> also, to Malcolm, thank you for taking care of those boys. Our family now has a very unique relationship with Travis's family and Erica's family and with Malcolm and Regina. All I can think of is that those three are still pulling pranks on one another. I guarantee it. Skip something, sorry. Also, um, he wasn't just a friend to eight and unit. He was a part of their families. He was Uncle Heat to Brute, Grayson, Zoe, Zaley, and so many other friends of Roscoe's. Roscoe, I promise to celebrate you every single day, and we are going to continue to make new memories. You are a true rock star. Our world is a little different without you here physically, but one thing I assure you, you have made me not only the middle child, but one hell of a proud big sister. Please continue to visit us. Fly high, little brother. I love you. We're now going to have some real singers sing for us. Would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Would you be the same if I saw you in heaven? I must be strong. Beyond the door, there 
There's peace, I'm sure, and I know there'll be no more tears in heaven. Would you call my name if I saw you in heaven? Would it be the same if I saw you in heaven? I must be strong and carry on. Cause I know I don't belong here in heaven The book of Isaiah tells us that if we have hope in Jesus we can soar on wings like a eagle and today Roscoe Jimmy and Travis are soaring. So for now, it's not goodbye. It's kind of like when I was dating my wife, you know, there'd come the end of the evening, the end of the day when you wouldn't want to leave. So you, you would follow each other out to the gate and kiss goodnight, and then we'd stand at the, the door of the car, and we'd say goodnight some more, and then she'd try to drive away, and you hold their hand. And then you let your fingers touch as long as you can until you can no longer feel your fingers touch anymore. Well, today we let go. But it's not goodbye. It's just so long. Because soon we'll be together again. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joyous words today, for the memories, the laughs we're about to share, and the food we're about to partake in. But most of all, we thank you for Roscoe Brian Gray. We thank you for his friendship, we thank you for giving us a great son, brother, uncle, a man who made us laugh, a man who loved us, and a man who was there when we needed him the most. Bless his soul, Father. Keep control of him in heaven the best you can. We know he's doing things his way. Let him build that motorcycle track, because someday, Many others will be joining him there. And until then, God, bless us with beautiful memories, heal our hearts, and keep those memories in our hearts and not our heads. Because too often, our brains forget what's too important, but our hearts always remember. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The family would like to ask that you stay for a meal prepared by the Alexander family. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of their catering Sierra Smoke uh, has prepared an a afternoon lunch for us. Uh, once everyone gets their meals and gets seated, then we will pass around the mic and share funny stories. Um, Sue and Aaron and, and Krista, how would you like to dismiss people for, for lunch? First up on the stick is going to be Keenan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Um, for those I haven't been able to meet yet, my name's Keenan. Roscoe and I were dating. We were still in the initial stages where everything was so new and exciting and perfect. And one thing that drew Roscoe and I together was our love for aviation. Any pilot, well first, they'll tell you that they're a pilot. But then they'll continue on and say that learning to fly is one of the most difficult trainings to accomplish. It's a love that wakes you up before the sun rises to study and prepare for your flight. It's a daily grind for months where some flights don't go well and you have to come back the next day and be better. To get your private pilot's license, you must prove to your instructor that you can take off and land without any assistance. 
You must be able to navigate cross country without a GPS and only a compass and a map. You must learn all the rules and laws associated with flying. You need to learn how to make radio calls and communicate with control agencies. You must fly, navigate, and communicate all on your own without any assistance from your instructor. This is just scratching the surface of the knowledge and skill you, need, you must demonstrate to get an endorsement from your instructor. And then you need to prove to an examiner that you're ready to get your license. The learning in the long days didn't stop there. Roscoe continued on to get his instrument rating, commercial certificate, and certified flight instructor certificate, which all demanded more of him every day with every additional rating and certificate he pursued. Where did this passion and love for aviation come from? Roscoe's passion for aviation started when he was little. He had a couple of helicopter rides as a kid and loved it, but knew he was always going to follow in the family footsteps in a tree care industry. August 18th, 2010, Roscoe had a work injury that resulted in him being medevaced to the hospital in a helicopter. It was the flight that changed his life. While en route to the hospital, he became determined to learn how to fly. Roscoe refers to this moment as the best part of your worst day. When Roscoe made the decision to learn how to fly, he had challenges he had to overcome. Roscoe refused to take no for an answer. He was determined. Roscoe started flight school in 2012 and later that year received his license. He continued his flight training and received his certified flight instructor certificate in 2015. His ultimate goal was work in the utility sector, specifically long line operations. And on Valentine's Day, of 2019, he was hired by PJ Helicopters, and he has been living his dream every day since. Roscoe was everyone's biggest fan. He always cheered people on as they knocked out their goals and went after their dreams. Roscoe was genuinely happy and excited for others' successes. He knows the challenges that students face as they pursue their passion for aviation. It brings me great pleasure to announce that we are working to create a memorial foundation to give out scholars, aviation scholarships in Roscoe's name. We've created a GoFundMe, which will go live this evening. Our vision is to create this foundation by the end of the year. This fundraiser is to help raise money to get the foundation up and running and for the initial set of scholarships. We hope to begin accepting applications next year for multiple types of aviation scholarships, ranging from rotary and fixed wing private pilot licenses to instructor certificates. We plan to announce the scholarship recipients annually on April 15th, Roscoe's birthday. We want to continue Roscoe's legacy of helping others achieve their dreams with these aviation scholarships. Fly high, Roscoe. Woo! Tricked you. Hey guys, uh, my name is Noah Haydenmeyer. Um, Roscoe had become one of my best friends. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are going to say, say the same thing. And Roscoe had the capacity to be that for a lot of different people. And honestly, he was the most genuine, empathetic friend that I think I have. He, he genuinely showed interest in what I had going on in my life. Uh, and you mix that with his sense of humor. The way he laughed is wheeze. Uh, yeah. His, uh, he didn't have a fear gene. You put all that together and you end up with a pretty incredible human being that uh, I feel so fortunate that I had in my life. Um, Roscoe and I were on the phone a couple weeks before he passed away and we were talking about helicopters and the, uh, the thought of experiencing an engine failure came up. And I said to him, I hope that never happens to me. And he immediately responded and said, I do. And I was shocked. And then he followed it up with saying, I want to see what I'm made of. And honestly, everything that Roscoe has ever done that he's really excelled at, in my opinion, is because he wants to see what he was made of. It's why he rode motorcycles the way he did. It's why he climbed trees the way he did. It's why he moved out to Hawaii with me to learn how to fly helicopters, because he wanted to see what he was made of. And all of us knew it, but he constantly was trying to 
to push and pressure himself to figure that out. Um, and he died doing something he loved. I guarantee if you sat there and told Roscoe, you're going to die doing this, he would smile at you and keep doing it. <laughs> and that gives me some peace. I, I, uh, it's hard not to get frustrated about the situation, but I know he absolutely died doing what he loved. And I will forever cherish that and speak his name and tell some of the stories that are fit to tell and uh, <laughs> keep, keep the other ones to, uh, to myself and, and uh, try and keep his name alive. And my most heartfelt condolences to the Gray family. I love you guys. Uh, I'm recently a new father, and so I couldn't imagine being in this situation. So love you guys, and it's amazing to see everybody up here. Thanks. Hey everybody, um, I'm Uncle Mike, known to Roscoe Brian. I call him Brian because that's what he was to me, and out of respect, he's Roscoe Brian today, always. I just wanted to share a, a memory because it was funny, and <laughs> and uh, it triggered something else that um, lets me deal with. You know, missing him. Uh, years ago, about when he was 15, we made a trip to Urington to go on a mo motorcycle ride. And now I live in Nevada, and I was taking that near the same road as the staging area, and something told me, uh, I seen that sign Bridgeport, and said, well, I think I'll go that way. So I turned around, took that exit, and I'm riding along, and uh, the wind's blowing sideways. I'm leaning into the wind. There's dust blowing across the road, tumbleweeds. And I'm like, this is pretty awesome. And I, I take these pills. It makes me urinate a lot, so I got to stop. <laughs> I pull over a lot, and I pulled over at the entrance to our staging area. And I look down through the sagebrush at this road, and I see it go up. And I remember... Me and Roscoe Bryan coming after a long day riding, coming down that nice, sandy, smooth road, just tired. And, well, I was tired. I don't know about him. He's 15. And uh, not really paying attention. All of a sudden, there's this G out from a sand wash in front of us. So I'm like, whoa. And uh, of course, no, couldn't slow down. Hit this G out. I don't know if you've ever been in a travel hall, the Valal as we affectionately know it. You got about this much headroom, and that day we needed it. Because <laughs> we were flying in the air, looking at each other and just laughing. That was the, the best ride ever. So I'm standing there on that road, thinking about that, and uh, got back on the bike, headed for Bridgeport, got nailed by one of them crop circle sprinklers, I was all right, still having fun. And uh, then it starts raining and then hailing. And I come up to a mudslide in this canyon. And I'm like, better slow down a little bit. Made it through there a little bit squirrely. And the whole time, it dawned on me later as this great feeling was just coming out of me when you feel so good. Just like, you can't help it, it oozes out. And later on, it occurred to me that when I stood there, looking down that road, Brian Hawthorne with me. And we went for that ride. So he's with us. He's with us always. And he wants us to be happy and remember the good times. Because he's got a lot of them. That's how I cope with it. Miss him always, but he's so funny, his laughter. All, everything I've heard today is on key, and uh, that's the way I can remember him. That's the way I deal with it. Thank you, Brian. Love you, Roscoe. Hey, there's a bunch of you guys out here right now. I know. It's in your head. It's like, oh, I don't want to get up now. 
No, I don't want to say that. Oh, maybe I drank too much. Whatever. I'm talking to that table right there. Hey, I would uh, like to share a story about... You guys were, you were, just, you were just telling us about the day that uh, he decided to become a pilot. I think I'm the first person that got wind of that. I was working with Roscoe. Actually, I spent the evening the night before Roscoe had the accident with his arm. Okay? Uh, we were taking a tree out in Twain Hart, uh, Twain Hart tree job, basic one that he used to do, humongous tree, it was around a deck, the people wanted it, they wanted their deck back, they built a deck around their tree, Roscoe took the whole thing out with his crew, there's a hole in the middle of the, um, this is just my perspective, I don't know, I never asked him about this, but this was my perspective of that day, and maybe why he became the pilot, he Anyways, he took the tree down. There's a hole in the deck. Huge hole. Humongous. Uh, he's walking, picking up his stuff and cleaning all of his stuff. And if anybody ever watched him work, he, he, you would watch him work. If he was showed up at your house and he was taking a tree down, his crew was amazing. They were meticulous. They were on point. They showed up. They weren't messing around. And they were taking that tree down and getting your yard cleaned up as fast as they could. They were the most professional group I've ever seen. Okay, and this was just his tree stuff, so I can imagine what kind of pilot he was. Anyways, he was walking, and he's looking at me, and he fell through the hole in the deck. And he tried to catch himself. Okay, it's about two stories. He tried to catch himself, and he ripped his arm open. Okay, coincidentally enough, I ripped my arm open last week, which is weird. I was telling the story about Roscoe, and I looked down at my arm. I was like, oh, crap, I ripped my arm open too. And I was telling the story, just like I am right now. Anyways, he, look, he gets up, smiles, and looks at me, and passes out, okay? Passes out on the ground. Me and a few other guys got him in the truck, took him down to the Tuolumne, uh, Twain Hart Fire Station, who, if any of them are here, excellent job. They got him in the truck, took him down to uh, the outpost, and they meta-flighted him. I get a text about half an hour after this whole thing happened, okay? He says, Maddie, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a helicopter pilot. And the thing about it was, is he meant it. And you be, I, be, I immediately, immediately knew that that was what he was going to do. Because he didn't say stuff like that. He didn't, he didn't say, you know, I'm going to become an astronaut and fly to Mars. He said, so right now, there's some of you guys that are thinking about sharing some of your memories, and I want to hear some of them, and we all want to hear some of them, okay? So uh, find that helicopter pilot in your spirit right now and get up here and share some stories with us. Love you, Roscoe. I'm not allowed to say my name up here because I've been told by multiple people I'm not allowed to grab the mic. But this is more of a tribute to his father. The last time I seen Roscoe, I was driving up to Sugar Pine to do an electrical job for Phil Coke. And I seen somebody up in a tree so high up that it scared me. And I knew before I even got there that that would be mother load tree service. And that was going to be Roscoe Gray up in that tree. This is a tribute to how you raised your son. On his vacation, he came up here to help his father do the most dangerous tree jobs on top of whatever else he was doing. And that is living life to the fullest. And I will not go into any other stories. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. What, what a beautiful thing to see all of us come together and love one another, to share stories, to hang out, and to, and to show respect to such a beautiful person that inspired us to be the best we could be. And... Uh, such a giving soul. 
that after doing what he did for a living, He'd go up to Grand Dog's house on the weekends, fall trees, trim trees, because he loved her, he loved me, he loved us, and that's just the kind of person he was. Um, I, I literally have so many SCO memories and stories. <laughs> one of the one of the funniest is that living at Grand Dog's house on the on the weekends we used to we'd go to Tuolumne Market and they used to sell this habanero sausage <laughs> and the shit was hot, dude. It was like literally burn your butthole hot, right? <laughs> and this for. Like, we're planning on Monday for next Sunday. As soon as we eat it and we're, like, di like struggling with the heat and the excretion of it, like, we're, like, can't wait till next week. And, I mean, I'm, like, I got two pounds of it. What you got? He's, like, uh, I got the biscuits. I'm, like, okay, let's go. And uh, I used to cook it with a bandana on because, I mean, literally – the heat from cooking it would make me sweat so bad. So then, I, this, is, this is just one kind of story. Like we, we used to eat this habanero sausage, sweating, screaming loud, cooking. My mom and sister would be like, these guys are fucking crazy. These guys are just nuts. And I'm like, so what? You want a bite? You want some, mom? She's like, no. No. So we'd, we'd eat the biscuits and gravy and literally call each other an hour and 22 minutes later on the shitter talking about how amazing this is right now. Like how good it was going in and how great it is going out. Just super excited. That was the kind of humor and, and, and just memories we had together. Um, Cody, Sko, and I, for a time period, man, it was tight. We used to, like, do whatever we wanted to do and come home to Grand Dog's house. And Cody, like, I had a bed, a couch, and a recliner in my bedroom. It was a safe zone at Grand Dog's house. And these fools would alternate couch to recliner every other weekend for like, I don't know how long it was. Houseboat, Brian's birthday party houseboat, dude, road surfing on the way back, watching dazed and confused and eating chicken nuggets till we like passed out and woke up two days later. He would, and no, and it didn't matter what we did the night before. That fool would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, ready to work his ass off, climbing trees, keeping a gangster, just going out to the fullest. And it, I didn't know how he did it. I literally could look at him and it was like, dude, bro, how are you doing this right now? He was literally one of a kind, the biggest heart, his love for my grandma just his heart for all of us his giving nature and his amazing personality is something that like I'll keep and I'll try to I'll try to keep going in my own right as long as I live and I know one of the first things he did was give Grand Dog a hug because he loved her so much. We had, to, we had so many times at the Epi, at the Villa, 
And that as, like, I mean, get out of here. Like, it was, oh, dude, it was, it was, it was unreal there, stretch a period of time. And, uh, you know, I, I love the Gray family. I love all of you for, I mean, I appreciate you all for showing up. And giving, giving love to someone who deserves so much love. And uh, <laughs> we went to so many Niner games together. That we, I, can't even, I can't even tell you all the things we got to do together. And it was so much fun knowing him and having such a savage time. And then as we got older, it got realer. And, uh, you know, Ross, Ross, I love you. Sue, I love you. Okay? The whole Gray family, all the friends, all the family. It's, it's honestly literally a very beautiful thing to see us all come together today to hug one another, to share these stories on the mic, to show our emotions, to, to share our love for someone that we loved so much and still love so much, but then to love each other moving forward so much. So, uh, one last, woo -hoo! I got to tell this story about one time me and Roscoe went wine tasting and they give us these glasses and he's like, well, I, want a big, I want one of those big glasses like that guy over there has. And the guy's like, well, you're just doing the wine tasting and you didn't pay. And so, and so this guy, I don't know if he's here right now, but it's a guy from the Hatcher in Murphy's. It's the underground place. And we're sitting under there and this place is badass and every single one of the wines that the guy gave it was like he'd come over to Roscoe and he'd be like how was that one was that one good and Roscoe would be like ah, was, ah. He'd be, and he'd he pours it he'd go like this and when the guy poured it in there he was like ah, 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 instantly he'd be like this and the guy was like you did not pay you did not pay and the, we get to the very end of the list every single one Roscoe was like now nah, did you like that one? You don't know. I don't like that one. And so they give him the very last one at the end, and he goes, well, so what do you think about that one? And he goes, I think you need to get some salt and some lime because all that shit was fucking gross. And the guy chased us out. He chased us out. And he still remembers me. I tried to go in there the other day, and he was like, yeah, you're not allowed back in here ever. All right, I guess I'll go again. So speaking of wine, I knew that Roscoe was the one because he was not going to drink my wine. <laughs> this is kind of the relationship Roscoe and I had. We always roasted each other. And I will say sometimes I was slightly better at it, but he'll never admit it. My story against his. But one memory that I remember, and this is just kind of how he just how I remember him. He worked hard. And he gets home and he snaps me a selfie and he's like, I'm so tired. And I was like, okay, so he's at home. We're texting back and forth. We're talking about something. And we get on the, the topic of the highest compliment you can receive is to be called hoggy as fuck. So, but I didn't know this at the time. He goes, just He's like, whatever you do, just don't say, he's, or no, he says, say I'm not hoggy as fuck. And I go, all right, you're not hoggy as fuck. And then he sends me a sad face. And I go, I don't understand. I just did what you, I just said what you told me to say. And he goes, you just said I'm not hoggy as fuck. And I go, I'm confused. And now I feel like, like I'm the guy in the relationship, and I'm trying to do everything right, and I can't. So now I'm like, all right, I'm just going to call him because something went wrong. He's upset with me. I said what I was supposed to say. And I call him. I FaceTime him. And now he's in the car. And I'm like, bro, you just said you were at home so tired. 
And I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, Taco Bell has a free Taco Tuesday. <laughs> if you go to Taco Bell today, you get a free taco. And I'm like, okay, I guess you're not that tired. But so, and then we got on the topic of how hoggy as fuck is the highest compliment. So now I've learned my lesson. That's why he was so sad. So then he gets to Taco Bell, and I was like, hey, tell them that, that I'm at home, and you're going to bring a taco home to me. We lived about two hours away, so I was not at home waiting for a Taco Bell. Also, I would never eat that. He knows that. It's okay. He's fine with it. So he, uh, he pulls up to the drive-thru, and he tells the lady, he goes, hey, I have my girl at home. Uh, because of COVID, I didn't bring her with me, which doesn't make any sense. But he tries. Unfortunately, he did not get two free tacos that day, but we tried. A few days later, it's April 1st, and I text him. And I said, hey, I just want to let you know that you're hoggy as fuck. And then after work, he says, he texts me, he goes, man, I just got off. This made my day. And I said, well, then I won't let you know that it's April 1st. I got to tell this story. Um, so anyways, I'm Taylor Gray's father-in-law. When my son went into the Navy, he left Taylor at home for a little while. And until he got established down there, and then Taylor went to meet him in San Diego. But anyways, I started thinking, I'm like, Roscoe, I need to get him over here to our property because I got some trees I need to cut. And so anyways, I'm like, hey, Roscoe, check it out. You got to pay your, daughter, your uh, niece's rent. That's what I told him. I asked him, like, hey, could you come cut some trees for me? And uh, I only wanted this one tree, like, maybe winched across the creek. It was a nice oak. You know, I needed it for firewood. But this guy pulls up with every bit of equipment they had. And, like, he cleaned up all these trees. And it was incredible to me. Um, um, I never seen someone cut a tree, this huge, I had a dream. I needed a tree uh, put across the creek for my water pipe. Because I had a water pipe that went across the creek, and it kept breaking every winter. Roscoe came. And he put this freaking huge tree right across this big creek gully, the one that comes down from Twain Heart, so I could attach a water pipe to it. And I never seen anyone do a slow fall somehow on this tree, this huge log. He put it across the creek with the crown going up, by the way. And so when it settled, it was nice and level. I couldn't believe it. It was just kind of a dream of mine, and he actually did it. And that's the kind of guy he was. And then he took home 36 chainsaw blades that I dulled, sharpened them. And that's why I know that cat's telling the truth, because he brought them back the next day. 36 sharp chainsaw blades that I had dulled. And... Um, so I just kind of had to share that story. I couldn't believe this guy. And then here's the kicker is that I met a guy named Brian before my son married into the family. So we were already friends before, before I met him again later at Sue's house. I'm like, oh, my God, awesome. This is just getting better the whole time, you know. And so, anyway, I wanted to share that. I, I love that guy. And you know what? When I think of Brian, the word honor just comes to my mind. He was an honorable guy. And uh, I don't know. That's, that's the word I associate with that guy. He did what he said. And that's a hard, that's something society, as you well know, is like missing out on. If we needed more of Brian in this world. See, he left a standard of honor to his buddies and a higher standard 
for everyone to really uh, live up to. So he was a great dude. I'll always remember that guy. I've been able to have the privilege of hanging out with Roscoe on the clock and off the clock. And uh, I think some of the most funniest stories in my mind right now are his poop stories. And uh, I remember um, after I started working for Ross and we became really great friends, and he asked me one day, he said, hey, I really want to get into the rock climbing thing that you do. Can you take me up one of those big walls? And I said, absolutely. You know, I would, I would love that more than anything in the world. And what he came back and told me was, well, what I really want to do is get up on that wall and poop off of it. You know? He said, can you videotape me or take a picture of me pooping off the portal edge? You know? And, uh, and then one of his, you know, we'd, I'd, I'd be out on lead climbing, and he'd be at the belay eating <laughs> his candy, whatever it was. He'd be eating an apple, you know, and then he'd look up at me while I was climbing and he'd say, so I hear an apple a day keeps the scared away. Is that true or is that just an old big wall wise tale? <laughs> and just the laugh that comes out of that man, you knew you were having the best time in your life when you heard that laugh. Right? I should have taken the video for him. He wanted so bad to put a glove on, poop in his hand and then toss it. And I was like, whoa, I don't know, brother. <laughs> I, like your, I like where you're at. And, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of good tree jobs, and I miss you, Ross. I miss working with you. I miss working with all you guys out there. I miss Ross. Sorry about your guys' appetite. <laughs> I met Ross and uh, Roscoe when I was younger. Uh, we had a cat that got stuck in a tree. So uh, Ross came out with the, with the bucket truck for free and rescued the cat and everything. And Union Democrat put it in the paper. It's something we still do. Uh, I took over the business and uh, still offer that free cat rescue based on that first experience. You know, it's just tradition. So obviously I had pretty big shoes to fill, but uh, I was taught by the best. Um, I kind of went into it, you know, I was not sure what I was getting into, but it took over my life and it was more than just a job. Like um, Jamie said, we had a lot of good experiences on and off the clock, so. The fun never ended, you know, and it was just a whirlpool. Once you got into it, you know, you had to hang on. You never knew where you'd end up on a Wednesday afternoon, you know, 100 feet over a clear cut between some line that Roscoe put in the tree as an idea to take a picture where you look like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it, you know, and I was like his little brother, and I looked up to him like my big brother, and uh, we were all family. Once he um, got the idea, you know, he wanted to get serious about the helicopters, uh, my sister, who was a pilot at the time, got him a job down in Southern California at Van Nuys, where he was an instructor. Um, I was kind of taking over the, the tree side of things at that point, and I was alone. You know, I wanted to be with Roscoe as much as I could, but he had to, he had to grow too, and so we kind of passed on torches to each other. Um, you know, the, the memories and the jobs, they go on forever, and I, I still go by and drive all over the, the county, and I can see old cuts he made, and you can bet they were perfect. You know, he'd even go up after another company was done in a big oak tree, say, on the side of a main road, and we'd have to go fix it. He couldn't sit with that, so. Made a, 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 a gag video, too. One time we were driving by Groveland Fire Department, and he looks over at the cut, and he falls asleep, and he, he passes out for about 10 seconds, and somehow only he could drive that straight for that long. And that was also the job, uh, he got stung by a swarm of bees. Uh, yep, we had no clue, we were trimming some big swamp oaks. Um, and 
he was up, you know, probably 65 feet, full extended in the bucket truck, and he's just hogging into this big round. And all of a sudden, the saw stops running, and we look up, and he's swatting and cussing, screaming, fuck, fuck, just losing it. And he's trying to come down as fast as he could, and the hydraulics, you know, it was like a foot a second, maybe, and he's got 60 feet. So he was coming down, getting some stings, and he was dead serious. He goes, Jake, I need an epi shot. So he pulls his pants down, and there's his ass, and I had to stick that epi pin right into his leg and drive him to uh, Deo so he could get a peanut butter. <laughs> then we went to prom care. <laughs> so. um, he was a guy who, anything he did, he went 120% into it, and uh, he was always at the top. It could be flying, it could be fishing, riding a motorcycle, skydiving. And when he was up there, he would always reach down and, and try to bring you with him. You know, he always, he never forgot about you. And uh, he had a, an alarm written that would show up on his phone twice a day. Just as a reminder, you know, that to keep him humble. It says, uh, you're not cool. You're bald AF and make mistakes all the time. Be humble, but have fun and shit out. But most importantly, you're not cool. <laughs> Miss you, buddy. Seems like nobody else has anything to say, and we all appreciate who Roscoe was. I know he wouldn't be able to handle this much moment of silence, so let's keep on keeping on, you guys. We all love that man. He was a great individual, so let's keep it going. Hi. I'm Aunt Amy, and I just have a, just a brief little story to tell about Brian. Um, when he was a little kid, his sisters tormented him. And they would put him up to all kinds of things, you know, like you have to wear this dress or you have to do this or that or you can't play with us. And they'd make, make little skits. And then um, A.J. Bushalaki and, and Brian would have to act out these little plays and it was hilarious, but every once in a while, I think they'd push Brian a little bit too far, and he didn't, he was too little to really have strong cuss words, so he'd say, you dumb dummy, <laughs> or the worst was, you hammerhead shark, <laughs> and that was about, you know, it, that was the extent, I think anything stronger, and he probably would have got a smack from Sue, but, um, <laughs> but I just I just remember him as a as a little kid and you know hammerhead sharks. <laughs> Any kind of sandwich he wanted. <laughs> That's all. Love you, Brian. Gonna miss you terribly. Um, I would like to thank everyone for coming here. Most importantly, I want to thank my Uncle Randy and Aunt Shirley for opening up their gorgeous home and dealing with all this chaos. But um, I think everything went well. Thanks to uh, Sierra Smoke for providing amazing food. Um, Deo, thank you, Tony and Chanel, for the awesome Roscoe's Peanut Butter Blast, Hurricanes, Ice Teas. Um, and whatnot, but thank you everyone for sharing, um, and I'm so glad, I know a lot of people, um, there's some pilots that came from uh, LA, PJ, um, employees, my new family here, thank you guys for making the trek up here and celebrating my amazing rock star brother. <laughs>